Hello, everybody, and welcome to chapter three, where we will discuss important terminology. So before I begin on terminology, it is important to acknowledge and face head on the fact that Dubai's real estate story has been tumultuous. There have been many ups and downs. There was a massive recession in 2008 worldwide that impacted Dubai's um, properties and investors massively. There was a real estate bubble in 2013 and 2014 where the prices were artificially increased and then they all crashed, causing a lot of people to run off with other people's money and a lot of people to go broke. This is a horrible mistake and the laws have changed dramatically to prevent these mistakes from happening again. These are questions that we will certainly receive many, many times from investors that are new to the country. And it's important to uh, acknowledge and use this knowledge to make changes in the future. It's also our job as brokers to be knowledgeable um, enough about the laws in order to calm our investors down and help them understand that this won't happen to them. Um, according to Property Finder, the transactions have increased in 2022, even above the level of 2013, which was the last major real estate bubble. So is this caused simply by population growth, uh, economic growth, or is this another bubble, right? First of all, we can't be sure, but I feel quite confident that it's I feel quite confident that it's not just a bubble because of some of the changes to regulations I will be covering now. One of them being the introduction of the Rental Dispute Center in 2013 that will protect the rights of landlords and tenants. They can uh, raise different types of disputes there and um, prevent any misunderstanding, miscommunication that causes major loss to one of the parties or both of the parties. Another one is um, a more stringent um, implementation of escrow. So escrow is when a bank holds on to the funds of a developer and the DLD will release those payments slowly over time. Um, a registration trustee was also uh, created in 2013, which are basically offices that are allowed to conduct real estate transactions outside of the hours and locations of the DLD. So you don't have to go all the way to the DLD and wait in line and go through any kind of bureaucracy in order to get your paperwork done. You can get it done in a lot of different places. Um, for people taking the RERA exam, you should note that a lot of the services of the registration trustee cost more if your property is valued over half a million dirhams and less if they are valued under half a million dirhams. Um, fees are different for every service, but some of them will look like the one I put here as an example, 4,000 dirhams plus VAT or 2,000 dirhams plus VAT. Here's a list of some of the registration trustee services. They can provide you with your title deed in 30 minutes. They can also conduct the registration of ownership transfer for sale of a property. They can do mortgage, property blocking, gifts and grants, development, pre-registration or registration for off-plan properties. They also have services such as pickup, MOU preparation, priority service, free consultation, legal translation, and attestation. For escrow, I just want to explain it once in layman's terms, just for anybody who is not up to speed with it. You can feel free to skip ahead if you already understand escrow very well. Uh, I have an example. It's going to sound a little bit basic, but if it does the job, then that's the most important part. Um, let's imagine there are two children who are siblings and one child owes the other one 50 lollipops um, in exchange for something. Let's say um, one sibling helped another one and said, OK, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to give you 50, dir uh, 50 lollipops. The mother is aware that if the sibling receives 50 lollipops, that they might go crazy and eat all 50 and get very sick. So they decided that they are going to hold on to the lollipops. That child has earned the lollipops. It's theirs. They don't have to um, uh, perform well just to 
deserve the lollipops that they already earned, but they will be receiving the lollipops at a rate determined by the mother. Um, if the child decides to behave badly, the lollipops are something that can be withheld if they are being grounded, for example. So eventually that child will receive all 50 lollipops, but just not all at once. And uh, this simple pedantic example is just a way to describe how if you were to give the developer access to all of the funds for the construction of a property, but it's only 20% complete, what if they run out of money during this construction process because they were spending um, uh, recklessly in the beginning stages, if they had wasted money, or if they withdrew all the money and used it to put into another escrow account to fund another project. These are all things that the government wants to avoid. So, of course, being controlled in this tight manner can sometimes be suffocating if you are the developer, but there's a reason for that. And that reason is many developers in the past have taken advantage of escrow to fund other accounts to eventually um, claim that they don't have enough funds to finish the construction project, they don't have any more money, they are bankrupt, but the customer, the client, the investor has already paid the money. They've lost all their money and the developer can't pay them, they might run off or declare bankruptcy. This is not fair and that's why escrow is so strict. So. On this slide, I wrote that the escrow account agent is a bank that is approved by the Dubai Land Department. The money is released based on construction stages. So the developer will inspect if it's 60% complete, they will release this much money and so on. 70% they will release this much money based on a schedule. After handover, 5% of the funds will still remain in escrow because the developer's responsibilities are not complete. They still must fix any structural changes, any electrical maintenance related defects um, for a year after handover. Developers are also responsible for all the smaller changes, little maintenance things after 10 years after handover. So here's just an example again to just really hammer in the point um, for the Shoba One project, that escrow account is its own escrow account and they can't use it to fund um, Crest Waves, for example, which is another project by Shoba. I, I hope I said that correctly. Um, in order to sell their project, developers must have 20% of the value of the project in the account. So this comes from the developer's own pockets. They also have to have 20% of the construction completed. So brokers take note, if the developers are trying to sell a project without these two completed, you might have to double check to see if they actually have an escrow account because the Dubai land department will not allow them to sell without those requirements. New developers still need to build a reputation and they might have to contribute up to 50% of the funds or construction stages. And there is a rumor that they will apply this rule um, to more developers, but we don't know yet. Uh, until the DLD uh, makes an announcement, we can't assume anything. So, Mash Rui. This is on the Dubai REST application. Anybody can download it and view projects and their stages of construction, as well as anticipated completion dates. So this is just a screenshot I took from the internet um, where a project called Forte is 90% complete. It's pretty important if you have invested in this project to know where the project is in its stages of completion. Master developers and sub developers. A master developer is a developer that is licensed to construct the real properties in Dubai and sell to other developers. A sub-developer is a developer that undertakes a part of the real property development under a master developer. Here are some of the master developers. We have Dubai Properties, who is the master developer for Mudon and JBR. Emar is the master developer for Marina, uh, downtown Dubai, Dubai Creek Harbor, Emar Beachfront, Emirates Living. Maras is the master developer for La Mer, City Walk, and Blue Waters. Nahil is the master developer for Palm Jumeirah, Palm Jabal Ali. T 
Tricom Group is a lesser known master developer, but they are in charge of Dubai Media City and Barsha Heights. Uh, DMCC is the master developer for JLT and Dubai Investments is the master developer for Dubai Investments Park. Um, here are some of the sub developers. So Select Group undertakes a part of um, Marina, Dubai Marina. Shoba has some projects in Shoba Heartland, in MBR City, and some standalone buildings. Danube properties have a lot of standalone buildings in International City, and Arjan, and Forjan. Meg has uh, buildings in JLT, and they have some projects now in Dubai Creek. Uh, Bengati has um, projects in JVC, Arjan, uh, Silicon Oasis, Al Haptur have some projects in Business Bay, Azizi have projects in Forjan and MBR City, Damak has Damak Hills 1 and Damak Hills 2 and some standalone towers, Omniet has some standalone buildings in Business Bay and in Palm Jumeirah, Tiger Properties has buildings in Marina, and um, uh, probably Business Bay as well. Ellington has projects in JVC and Business Bay. Dayar has buildings in Business Bay. Um, I'm missing out a lot of their projects. Each developer has delivered, uh, each of these developers that I've listed have delivered many projects. And there are many, many more developers that I haven't listed. Um, but that's just to give you some overall uh, general understanding that uh, there is a difference between master and sub developer. So short term leasing. This is um, tightly regulated by the Dubai Tourism and Commerce Marketing for any properties leased under six months. So this includes Airbnbs. And once you have a license for short term leasing, you have to run in a specific way. You have to provide fresh linens, cutlery, furnishings. You also have to pay VAT and you can collect tourism tax, but that's for the government. Um, uh, it's very difficult to run short term leasing on your own as a landlord. You can do it, but that's why holiday homes companies exist in order to take a lot of this paperwork and management off of your shoulders and they'll take a, pro a portion of your proceeds. But at least you can save a lot of your time. Freehold is for properties that you can buy as an expat. You don't have to be a citizen of the GCC in order to buy properties in these areas. Um, so you can basically sell them whenever you want and um, let your children or next of kin inherit the properties from you. Um, here are some examples of freehold properties listed by Bayute. They have a really good resource where they even summarize many of these communities for you. Uh, and I don't see a point in duplicating their effort. There is a lot of territories that are GCC only. So basically everything that wasn't mentioned in Freehold is a GCC only area. Uh, usually it would be indicated in property advertising advertisements if they are GCC only, but it doesn't hurt to double check if you are unsure. And as a broker, it is your responsibility to tell the client that they can't purchase properties in certain neighborhoods. Aside from freehold and GCC only areas, we have a third category, which are leasehold. This allows you to have ownership of a property for up to 99 years and it's renewable on expiry. So if you want to make modifications to your property, you will have to ask permission from the owner and uh, you can register your lease with a DLD or a registration trustee for 4% of the contract value. At the end of your contract, the property will return back to the owner. Some examples of communities that have leasehold properties are Dubai Investment Park and Silicon Oasis. Legal basics in Dubai. So the UAE legal system is based mainly on civil law and Sharia law is used for personal affairs for Muslims. English common law is used in the DIFC. So, the civil law was created in 1971 and they were written based on the civil code that already existed in Egypt, which was one of the most advanced civil codes in the Middle East at the time. 
common law is something that, in addition to written laws, allow judges to make decisions bound by precedent. Precedent being the outcome of previous cases. So Dubai's real estate law will be a mixture of the UAE civil code and decrees, which are laws that are added from time to time, and regulations, which are basically adding substance to decrees. For cancelled projects, there was a decree 21 of 2013, where DLD can create a judicial committee of at least three judges from Dubai courts to handle the liquidation of cancelled projects, and their decision is final. So it will be some combination of the developer reimbursing the uh, buyers or um, liquidation of the assets and construction site and things like that. It depends on the project, and there's a lot of uh, resources you can find online if you're interested in more information about cancelled projects. But as a broker, it's really important to know that something like this exists in the case that a project can get cancelled. POA stands for power of attorney. The power of attorney is somebody who is granted permission to sign on behalf of another party. So a POA is valid for up to two years and it can be either international or domestic. An international POA must be stamped by the foreign embassy and by the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If it's domestic, it will be stamped by a notary public. In the POA, you must be very specific on what actions must can be taken and for which property. So for example, A grants B permission to sign the MOU on his behalf for unit 1202 six at 17 Icon Bay. That's just a random unit. If you own that unit, I didn't uh, have anything to do with you. I just came up with something. But um, let's say there was a check that was ready to be collected. Can B take the check on behalf of A? No, they cannot. If they want to, there has to be a new POA for that purpose. The POA document can be in English, but it must be legally translated into Arabic, which is the official language. And if there is a discrepancy between the two languages, the Arabic will prevail. Gifts. So, if you are passing a property among your first of kin, you only have to pay 0.25% uh, of the fees. So this is husband and wife and parent and child. For second of kin, which is for brother and sister, siblings, and grandparents to grandchildren or grandchildren to grandparent, those fees are 4%. So some people might try and circumvent um, the 4% fees for second of kin by passing it twice along the first of kin. Uh, let's say a brother wants to give it to his sister, so he passes it to his mother as an intermediary. Some people have tried to get away with this. However, if the DLD catches on, they will start to investigate. And it could take a while and it could be costly for the family. The mother might not be equipped to hold on to a property for that amount of time. She wasn't intending on holding on to it for longer than it took for her to pass it on to her daughter or son. Um, so it just causes a lot of problems if you try and circumvent it. Um, and it's a lot easier to just pay the fees. I would always advise to pay the proper fees for the type of gift that you are trying to give rather than uh, facing potential consequences of getting caught. Usufruct. So this is a long-term lease. It sounds very similar to freehold because you can own a residential or you can live in a residential property for up to 99 years and if it's commercial you can use it for up to 50 years it's also renewable um, however you have less rights on the property you cannot change this uh, property at all and the lease is voided if you destroy the product of the property or if you misuse it um, the fees are two percent payable to dld or a registration trustee Similar to the usufruct is the musataha, so you also get rights to construct on the land as well as utilizing. So an example of musataha is if a landlord owns a plot and they don't 
want to use this land, but they do think that they can collect rental income and someone else can utilize the land, they might form an agreement with the client where the client will build a restaurant on land and run this restaurant. And um, let's say after their term has expired, they want to retire and move back to their home country. So the land returns to the owner and the owner might still have the restaurant on that terror on that land and they can decide what they want to do with it they can tear it down and form a new masataha agreement with another client or they can find another client who wants to run and operate this restaurant in a new masataha lease so it could be um uh so it can be used for an initial term of up to 35 years it can be extendable to 50 years and renewed two years before the expiry date. The fees for Masataha are 1% of the contract value and registered with DLD and the registration uh, trustee office. Wills. So this is quite an important problem uh, that expats might be curious about, especially when they buy freehold properties. If they don't have an explicitly written will, what will happen to their assets? Uh, especially living abroad in, in another country. So if you are Muslim, your assets will be divided based on Sharia law. As of February 2023, inheritance for non-Muslims have been modified so that you can use the laws of your home country. And I think this will give a lot of people peace of mind. Um, if you are interested in learning about Sharia law, there are other resources that can do a much better job at explaining. In the RERA exam, they're not going to ask you specific questions about Sharia law, but they sometimes will ask you questions about inheritance and they will explain how the assets are divided in that case. You don't have to memorize anything. Takarouge or Takarouge. Um, don't be afraid by this giant paragraph. I just wanted to put the definition as according to the Islamic Finance Encyclopedia. Um, but Taharuj is basically when a few siblings inherit a property and some of the siblings don't want to um, own this property anymore. They want to relinquish their, um, their claim and in, in exchange for money. So if they want to do this transfer, it's called Taharuj, and the fee is 1% to DLD. To whom it may concern is a service that DLD provides for landlords to get proof that they own a property. So sometimes they might need to prove to some authority that they own this and that property, and they need to do that with a statement of customer property and a certification of satisfaction of property management requirements. So they can go to a registration trustee and pay 120 dirhams plus knowledge and innovation fees, or they can go to DLD and pay 50 dirhams for the certificate with knowledge and innovation fees. So you can't do this for properties that you don't own. You can't go to the DLD and request information on the landlord of a property that is next to yours, for example. Um, that information is confidential. So jointly owned properties. This is a huge topic and uh, it's very important to understand it very well if you are an investor and especially if you are a broker who is looking to advise your investor on the implications of the shared uh, areas in the building that they might be investing in. So if you are in an apartment building, the shared areas can be the gym, pool, lounge area, um, these units are responsible, are the responsibility of all the landlords and they are responsible financially in the form of service charges and they also have a voice in terms of the management company and they can file complaints and get things changed based on their preferences. So law 6 of 2019, which repeals law 27 of 2007, uh, says that there is a three-tiered management system for jointly owned properties, and that is major projects, hotel projects, and all other projects. These um, laws were created to remove incompetent management companies. And in order to do that, they created new bylaws, service charges, and a new common property register. So 
Rara will select the management company to look over the common areas. So that management company will collect the service charges and use those funds to maintain the common areas. And an owner's committee is also selected by Rara where they are managing the um, management company. <laughs> they are verifying to see if the management company is managing it properly. They also will receive complaints from the owners. They will, re they will review the annual budgets and they can also request that Rara replaces the management company. They can even advise on who they think should be the new management company. So this gives the owners a lot of power and control over how their joint properties are managed. That's very good. However, if you don't want to pay service charges, there are consequences. First of all, there is a liability attached to your unit and you cannot achieve, uh, you cannot receive an NOC from your developer when you want to resell your property. So in order to sell any properties on the secondary market, you must obtain an NOC from your developer and you won't receive that if you have outstanding service charges unpaid. This can escalate. So the RERA can notify the managing body that the service charges are unpaid. The managing body can make a claim as directed by RERA within 30 days. If the service charges remain unpaid, the claim will escalate to the RDSC, which is a Rental Dispute Settlement Committee. This will then allow your unit to be sold at public auction and based on their decision of when it's necessary. Okay, so it's not up to you to decide when your unit will be sold. They can sell it at any point that they deem necessary in order to collect the unpaid service charges. So these properties are listed at emiratesauction.com if you are interested um, in purchasing. The owner is also liable for any court and legal fees as determined by the judge. Malak is where you can pay the service charges. So as a broker, it's important that you understand what these service charges are, why they exist, what happens if they don't pay it, and if the, if the uh, investor asks, this is where they can pay it, on MOLAC. Easement. An easement is the permanent right of the owner of one property to use the facilities of other properties. An example of an easement from another country is where two different neighbors um, have grassy yards and one person wanted to cross the lawn of their neighbor in order to get to some destination. The neighbor whose lawn got uh, crossed over wanted to uh, complain to the judge saying, uh, complain to the courts by saying, this is my property and that person can't use it. The decision was that that common prop, uh, that lawn is an easement. It can be used as a common property by your neighbor and they have basically indefinite rights to walk over your lawn to get to where they need to go. That was the conclusion from this court case. And uh, I just wanted to use it as an example for what an easement really is. Another example is when two buildings might share one staircase. One of the buildings will own that staircase, but the other building has indefinite use of that staircase, even though they don't own it. So that's another example of an easement. And uh, the final thing for this chapter is valuation. So property valuators are a, a trained um, profession in the real estate industry. There might be some valuation questions on the RARA exam, but none of them would imply that you know how to do valuation. It's important for you to understand that landlords can get their properties valuated at a cost and banks will conduct valuation when they are processing mortgage loans, um, landlords can use val valuations to determine the rental price, but they can't use valuation to supersede the rental increase cap. So it can only apply to properties that are currently vacant and they are trying to determine how much rental income they should charge. Okay, so now I want to um, give you some practice questions which are based off the rare exams that I have taken and based on just 
doing the research and deciding that, you know what, I think that would be a very good question. So hopefully these can be very useful for you when you're preparing for your RERA exam. Here we go. Question one. The broker can lose his or her license if they breach the code of ethics or regulations set by RERA, true or false. So feel free to pause and take notes. And at the end, I will give you the answers. Question two, the broker is always entitled to commission, true or false. Question three, all people, even if they are not a RERA registered broker, are entitled to receive commission, true or false. Question four, can you receive a residence permit from investing in property? A, no. Other conditions must be met aside from the investment. B, yes. However, the limit is 2 million dirhams. C, yes. There is no limit. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. D, yes. As long as a minimum of 750,000 has already been paid towards the property. Question five. It is ethical to guarantee future profits to make a sale. A, true. Be false. Six, holding a green card, a broker is eligible to sell a client's villa in a freehold area under Law 3 of 2006. A, true. B, false. Seven, it is outside of a uh, it is outside of a broker's duty to report unregistered brokers to RERA. A, true. B, false. Eight, as a registered broker, you must conduct due diligence to ensure that the escrow account for a project is made to a trust account under the name of the Dubai Land Department. A, true, B, false. Nine, it is standard practice to use contract A. Make sure all property listings are correct and to hide unsatisfactory information. A, true, B, false. 10. Some clients are treated better than others. It depends on the profit given by each. A. True. B. False. 11. Escrow accounts are under the name of A. Buyer. B. Project. C. Dubai Land Department. D. Developer. 12. A client is worried that the project does not appear to be under construction. Where can they see the construction progress? A. Dubai Rest. B. Trahisi Platform. C. DIFC Courts. D. Dubai Municipality. 13. What are the DLD fees for the transfer of title deed on a property valued at 3.5 million dirhams? A. 14,000 plus fees. B, 140,000 plus fees. C, 350,000 plus fees. D, 1 million plus fees. 14. It is acceptable for the broker to deposit cash in his or her personal account in order to transfer it to the seller. A, true. B, false. Okay, so now... We are ready for the answers. Um, feel free to pause until you are ready. I will share the answers now. So for question one, the answer is false. For question two, the answer is false. The broker is not always entitled to commission. Unfortunately, the broker tends to be the weakest link in many transactions. Sometimes the broker misses out on commission Despite the fact that they have made the deal, despite the fact that their names are on the papers, the, bro the commission is never something that they are always entitled to that they can claim back in the Dubai courts. Question three, false. You cannot practice real estate, which means you cannot um, receive commission if you are not a rare certified broker. Question four, D. This refers to that real estate investment um, visa, the Taskeen visa. Question five, 
false. That would be a misrepresentation and it is something that you can't guarantee because nobody can see the future. Question six, the answer is false. Okay, so this is an archaic broker's card. You have to kind of remember what the green card means. And green card is the person who works for the developer. So they can't sell secondary projects. Question seven, the answer is false. Okay, so it is your duty as a broker to report unregistered brokers to RERA. Question eight, the answer is true. You must conduct due diligence. Question nine, false. So the first two are correct. You must use contract A. You must make sure all property listings are correct. But the third one is not correct. You cannot hide unsatisfactory information. That is not in the broker's code of conduct. Question 10, the answer is false. You cannot treat some clients better than others. This is another part of the code of conduct. Question 11, the answer is B. The escrow account is under the name of the project, not the developer, not the buyer, and not the Dubai land department. Question 12, the answer is A. You can find the construction progress in the Dubai REST app under Mashrui. Question 13, the answer is 140,000 plus fees. So this is for uh, after you pay the 4% fees, you have to use a calculator for this unless you can do it in your head, but I recommend using a calculator. Um, question 14, the answer is false. You cannot deposit anything in your account. You are only the custodian to a check. Hopefully this was a valuable resource for you. I hope that you learned a lot and I hope that uh, these practice questions will help you perform better in the RERA exam.